One other movie that came out last year, it's not a music movie, but I wanted to talk about this one in depth because it, it really dovetails nicely with our topic today, and that is the movie about Mr. Rogers. How many of you saw that? Hands up. What was the actual name of it? Was it Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood? Would you, would you see it? Won't you be my neighbor? That's exactly right, because that was his uh, verbal thing in the, in the show. He said, would you be my neighbor? It was a song, I think, maybe, about it. So Mr. Rogers, for those of you that don't know, was an old-time TV guy. And um, he was a friend, especially to children, but he was a friend to everybody. And um, he was a one-of-a-kind guy, very unique, very memorable, and some might say irreplaceable. There's never been anybody like him since he left PBS. I think he was on 30 or 40 years on PBS. An amazing personality, very original. Talk about a brand. Mr. Rogers. And some of you are too young to have ever seen him on. Uh, so, so just a show of hands, how many of you actually saw Mr. have seen Mr. Rogers on television in some capacity? Oh, cool. So you've probably seen him in reruns or something like this. He passed away, sadly, uh, not long ago. But this movie, which kind of documents his life, talks about Fred Rogers and how he created this brand and what, you know, because he's been studied now. Just like people are starting to study Sweetwater. You know, he's been so successful, massively successful. And congratulations, by the way, on all of the, all the victories that you've had. I've been with you for a long time. It's been fun watching. I live in Detroit, by the way, and uh, I keep tabs on you guys all the time. And so they research Fred Rogers, and they come up with four things about Fred Rogers that helped him um, develop this irreplaceable, memorable brand. Irreplaceable and memorable are valuable characteristics in a brand. Would we agree? I mean, this is like, this is like, if you're going to shoot, I'm, I'm big on, um, I'm big on uh, outcome. Um, I teach presentation skills for a living. It's what I do. I, um, I do a lot of keynotes and travel and stuff like that. But my newest thing, and this is new since last time I saw you, is I developed an online coaching program called Present Like a Pro. And I tell the people that are onboarding into the class. I'm going to get you results. They don't even know what I'm saying when I say that. But I promise them that. I say, I'm going to get you results. And I'm so serious about it that we're not going to just aim at a target on the wall. We're going to aim at the bullseye of the target. You see? Everybody aims at the target. You'd have to be an idiot to see a target on the wall and not aim at it. But very few people aim at the bullseye of the target. Now, what are we talking about in practice? I used to use this guy's name all the time, and I've stopped using it because he got disgraced by the Major League Baseball, Roger Clemens, the great uh, Yankee pitcher. Whatever you think of his politics and his temperament and his off-the-field and on-the-field behavior, he was a fantastic pitcher. And before people stopped interviewing him, he used to tell people when he played catch with the rookies, He'd say, play catch with purpose. And what he meant by that was, if you're going to bother to throw the ball to somebody, right, aim at the left seam of their jersey on the sleeve. Aim at the third button on the jersey. Don't just throw it in the general direction of the guy that you're playing catch with. And, of course, this makes sense if you're going to be a pitcher because you've got to hit outside corners, right? You've got to hit certain parts of that strike zone and the reason that's important is because if it's a power hitter, the power hitter, if, if he's able to get his arms out, he can get the, that torque on the ball that he needs to put it into the bleachers. But if he has to keep his arms in, if you pitch him low and inside, he can't get his arms out. He's going to hit less home runs. That's how important it is when you're pitching, to hit the bullseye. But there's a bullseye in everything. I have a bullseye today in my talk. You have a bullseye in your job description, and it's measured. I know it is. And so to aim at that bullseye is a really good idea. So what people started to do after Fred Rogers died is they started to look at, well, what was this guy's bullseye? We're kind of, you know, reverse engineering it because nobody figured it out before he did it. We only figure it out after he does it because now it's important. Now the guy's irreplaceable and memorable. Let's figure it out. And what they figured out is he has four things that, uh, that you got to have if you're going to do what Fred Rogers did. And the four things are respect, empathy, passion, and optimism. 
and I'm going to break them down for you. So it's respect, empathy, passion, and optimism. I'll give you four examples of, of how Fred Rogers did it. And what we're going to do with everything we talk about today, guys and gals, is we're going to chase this outside example, Fred Rogers, to Sweetwater. Because we can. We can benefit from Fred Rogers. We can take the best of what he offered. Because you guys like all that stuff, right? Respect, empathy, optimism, right? You, like, you, like, you identify with those values. So let's see what we can learn from Fred. So with the uh, respect, there was a little, uh, a little anecdote about all of these. So Fred Rogers attends the daytime, daytime Emmys one time <laughs> to win an award. And uh, he goes to the podium, much smaller podium than that one. Really, any podium is smaller than that one. <laughs> and he goes to the podium, and you know, uh, if, you, if you've seen the Oscars or any, the Oscars were just on a couple nights ago, is that they had you on a timer. Even back then, they had you on a timer. And you only have a certain amount of time to talk. And what does Fred Rogers do in this prime time recognition of his show, where he has a chance to get more sponsorships for next year, thank his crew, thank his family, all the things that pe most people do in a thank you speech. What does Fred Rogers do in the valuable seconds that he has at the podium? He requests a moment of silence. He does the opposite of talking. And what do you think he wants the silence for? He wants everyone in the audience to take a moment to silently thank everyone that's helped them be successful. And he takes it out of his own clock. That's Fred Rogers. Who does this? Nobody. The second example is this idea of empathy. Uh, Fred is on tour all the time trying to raise money. It's public television, everybody. So he's got to find his own money. So he's courting a lot of sponsors and he's getting to know all these people. And he goes on these junkets to not only meet the public, but do interviews and just be the face of, uh, at first he was the face of his show, and then he became the face of public television. And at some point he finds himself in a neighborhood and um, some you know, rich benefactor lady family has a kid that's sick. And you can imagine, uh, he doesn't maybe even know the details of the illness, he just knows that this kid is important to this lady and so he's gonna make time to go to the house and be with this kid just to say hi he has no idea what he's going to see when he gets there. Would the kid even recognize him, remember him, whatever? And he gets there, and sure enough, the kid, who's got a lot of issues, uh, it's, it's in the research, it, telling you the name of what he has doesn't matter today. But he's got issues, the kid. He's mentally, his eyes are spinning all the time. He's in a wheelchair. He's got a lot of stuff going on. And he gets there to meet his hero, Fred Rogers, who he does recognize. But what does the kid do when they wheel him into the room? He acts out. And they have to wheel him out of the room right away. Well, Fred, on a valuable tour here, he's taking time out of his thing, and now the kid's acting out. They remove the kid from the room. So Fred continues to sip his tea, and he waits a few minutes, and he says, I'll, I'll go see him if you don't mind. So Fred goes into the kid's bedroom, and I think he's escorted by one of the parents, and he, and he sits on the bed, or the, wherever the kid is, and, he, and he's talking to the young man. He's, the kid's like seven. And he says, to, and you just wonder, what's, what's this irreplaceable, memorable personality going to do to turn this around? And that's what I was thinking as I'm reading the story. And here's what he did. He didn't tell the, he just didn't start talking to the kid. He didn't ask him about his hobbies and this stuff. He asked the child for a favor. This kid who can't do anything for anybody, he can't even wipe his own butt because of all of his problems. He can't do anything for anybody, and Fred Rogers asks him for a favor. Are you with me? And nobody had ever asked a kid for anything before, and the kid's a human being, and he wants to help his hero. And he zoomed right in on Fred, and he says, in his own way, what can I do? Yes, what? And it doesn't even matter, of course, what Fred asked him to do, right? The connection now is made, like E.T., you know, and the magic, the Fred Rogers magic has been performed once again. Empathy. Empathy is feeling what the other person is feeling. It's not sympathy. Sympathy is feeling sorry for the other person. Sympathy is a time waster. 
But empathy, ladies and gentlemen, is empowering. When another person knows that you get him, like Troy said a minute ago, you know, I'm a, mu I'm a former musician. I get Sweetwater. I know you've had a lot of speakers. Not all of them have played. Not all of them understand music. So when you get somebody, they appreciate it. And sometimes we have to work at that, right? But it's worth it, man. It is worth it. So what are we looking at so far? Respect was the Emmy speech. Empathy was how he responded to the seven-year-old sick kid. The next one is passion. PBS is dependent on public funding, but they can also accept government funding and they do every single year. The government funding is something that they can take to the bank on a regular basis because everybody likes public television. What they're hoping is to get that funding from the government increased every year, and that's not a sure bet. So what they used to do is send Fred Rogers to Washington, Mr. Rogers goes to Washington, to appeal for the money because he's now, at this stage in his career, he's the face and voice of public television. So he goes in front of the subcommittee for communication, and he appeals to the chair of the subcommittee, which is John, uh, Senator John Pastore, everybody. Tough guy. Uh, there's a video of it on YouTube. And uh, Pastore is you know, kind of like flip guy. He's got the big celebrity in the, in the chair now. You know, He's kind of moving around a little bit. I didn't like the guy in the video. And he says, well, uh, Mr. Rogers, what have you got to say about public television? He's kind of flip, you know. And, and Mr. Rogers, from his chair, you know, we have all these theatrics now where performers, we've got the green screen, we've got all these, you ever listen to this national anthem anymore and all the, there's a name for the vocal flips. It starts with an M, all these gymnastics that the singers do, you know. Oh, say can you see is like 50 notes, right? And... Uh, Back in the day, you know, that you, you could just stand and deliver. There's a fabulous video of a singer named Edie Gourmet. Some of the older people in the room might remember Edie Gourmet. She was married to, you remember, Steve Lawrence. And she sings a version of What Did I Have That I... Uh, is that it? What Did I Have That I Don't Have? She stands stock still. She's 18 years old. Like, you know, like a young Rihanna, if you can imagine that. She stands stock still. There's one camera. And the only camera technique is she zooms in slowly, slowly, slowly. Because the song is like this slow build-up grind. And by the end, man, she is rocking it. No gymnastics. No, just stand and deliver. Beautiful. And so Fred Rogers, from his chair, in front of the subcommittee uh, for communication in front of Congress, starts to speak to Senator John Pastore with no notes and the most amazing eye contact you have ever seen in a human being. You see it in the video. You can search it on YouTube. And he starts to talk about the importance of government funding for public television. And he's eloquent. And he takes his time. He, he's not standing, but he's, he's delivering, right? And he finishes his little speech and Senator John Pastore bangs the gavel and he says, well, sir, I'm not, I haven't been a fan of public television up until today, but you sold me. You've got your $70 million. And he bangs the gavel. Now, some of that may have been theatrical purposes for the senator, but the video still plays. And the passion, the point is that the passion that Fred Rogers brought to a normally staid congressional hearing was impactful. Can you do that when you're talking over beers with people about Sweetwater or your clients or you, the stuff that you sell, the gear that you sell? Can you have that kind of passion? Can you bring it? Because if you can, you're on your way to becoming uh, memorable because nobody's that passionate about their job and irreplaceable. And the fourth category for Mr. Rogers, first one was respect, second is empathy, third one is passion. The fourth one is optimism. 